Hi, and welcome to this second video on Intermediate Python. So I hope you enjoyed the first video on args and quarks. In this second video, I'm going to talk about enums or enumerations in Python. So enums is a topic that I've never seen covered in a beginner's course on Python, but I see so many, let's say, intermediate or advanced developers using this. And of course, not just others, I myself use enums quite a lot, and they're a great tool in your toolbox. So how I've structured this video is a bit different from other videos. In this video, we'll essentially spend the first few minutes looking at the documentation of enums. And the only thing, and I emphasize the only thing I want you to get out of this is to understand that, okay, enums is a thing, has some features, so what? This is what I want you to sit with every few minutes. Then after that, we'll go into Jupyter Notebook where I've pre-coded a few examples and we'll look at how to actually use enums. Because when researching this a bit, I see so many tutorials talking about what you can, strictly speaking, syntactically do with enums, which is fine, but they don't really explain why this is useful. So I think many people have looked at enums before have thought like, okay, enums is a thing, it has these properties, we can, for instance, iterate over them and so on, but why should I really use this and when should I use this? Once you understand the motivation and why you should use them, they're super simple to use. It's not like some difficult topic really at all, but they're super useful for getting your code to be more robust. So enough talking, let's head into the documentation for a few minutes and look at enums first. Okay, so now we're in the documentation for enums. And as I said before, we're just going to spend a few minutes here looking around. So enums are short for enumerations, and this is something that was added in Python in version 3.4. So I think most of you who are using Python professionally, hopefully, are using a higher version of 3.4. I think in most recent projects, you're probably up to 3.8 or 3.9, depending of course on how much legacy code is involved and so on, but you should definitely be above 3.5, 3.6 for many reasons. This is one of them. In 3.4 and above, you can use enums. So it says here that an enum or enumeration is a set of symbolic names or members bound to unique constant values. And this is probably not the most useful description, but the only thing you can gauge from it is that enum is some kind of collection of names and values. And so far, this probably sounds very familiar to a dictionary. So let's see a bit further. Typically, we import the enum module and specifically import the enum class. This is the base class for creating enumerated constants. So let's look at an example here. To create an enum, you can first, I mean, first import it, and then you use the class syntax, making here a class with colors, and here you inherit from this enum. So I hope you're familiar with basic class syntax, and this here just means that you inherit from this base class enum. Inside an enum, you can specify symbolic names, namely red, green, and blue, that has constant values, namely one, two, and three in this context. And member values, namely one, two, and three, as it says, can be anything, it can be integers, strings, tuples, and so on. Okay, so this is an enum. Let's see a few quick things you can do with enums. So here, enumeration members have human readable string representations. So if I go into color and go to the essentially member red, then I get color.red, looks nice. The type of color.red is an instance of the enum color class. And you can also see that you can use is instance on color.green, for instance, and say that, yeah, this is an instance of a color. So it returns true. Enumeration support iterations. So here I have a shake with vanilla, chocolate, cookies, and mint. And then I can just iterate through it, print it, and I get it. And also finally, they're hashable. So I can make an empty dictionary of apples. Then I can make a key with color red and value red delicious. And I can do this for multiple values or I can simply specify it like this. And here I can, of course, compare apples with this and this gives me the same thing. This marks the end of looking at the documentation. And as I said, what I hope you have gotten out of this so far is not really that much. This is the problem with enumeration when people teach it to others. It's this thing here is kind of dictionary-like, if you get what I mean. Here's the things you can do with it. So far, you probably understand what I've been saying, but do you really understand so far when you should use this? I didn't when I read this for the first time a long time ago, but now I do. And I want to share with you why you should use enums and how you should use it. So I want to go over in Jupyter Notebooks now and look at a few concrete examples for how to use this. Okay, so here we are in a Jupyter Notebook. You can see that I've already kind of pre-written all the code. I won't write the code in this lecture simply because that would just take too long time. I think the code is not so difficult. It's more important for me to go through and explain it. So here you can see at a glance, it's five iterations of something. And I'll show you how to make something gradually better by using different methods. And of course it will converge on using enums. But let's not jump in too fast, let's start at the beginning. So all the way at the top here, I have a function, and this function is called reduce RGB in color. It takes in some kind of color, 
as you can see here. And the doc string says that it should reduce red, green, and blue with 10 if possible. So it's a rather simple function. It should take in, uh, say, a tuple of three RGB values, a color RGB, and then essentially reduce all of them by 10 as long as that is possible. That means that if, for instance, one of the values are five, then it should just round it down to zero. So the logic is also pretty straightforward. You just make a darker colored RGB, which is a list with zero, zero, zero. Then you iterate here through the color RGB that is passed in. I use the enumerate function that allows me to get the index and the number, and just ask if the number is greater than 10. Then I set the darker color RGB for that index to be number minus 10. So if this conditional doesn't activate, then it's just left at zero. And then finally I return this darker colored RGB as a tuple. This is definitely not the cleanest way to implement this, but it's not the most horrible either. I don't want to give you examples where the code is pitch perfect. It's not like some software gore awful code. It could have been written a bit better. Anyway, let's keep it as it is. And you can see now that if I run this and run this thing here, I take in 126, 66 and 30, and these are reduced all by 10. And you can just check that if I started with something that was maybe eight, it just rounds it down to zero. Okay, moving on to the second iteration. In the second iteration, I've been told that there are certain amounts of permissible colors that should only be transformed by this function. So not all colors should be transformed, only certain ones. This may be some colors in a company logo, whatever. There are certain amounts of colors that we should accept, the rest we should just give a, say, a value error. Basic way of implementing this. So notice that the function is almost exactly the same, except that we have a check here that says, okay, if the color is in these three values, then do the same logic. If not, then we raise a value error. And you can see here, let's just run both of these, that this works perfectly. But now if I change this to be not one of the colors listed here, then you get a value error. Let me just change it back. And I think most of you look at this code now and see, okay, this strictly speaking works, right? But there is something not very good about this. The worst part is that you hard code in these values here. When I'm looking at this code, I generally have, first of all, no idea what colors these represent. I think that, I mean, 25500, that's red. This is the one I can do. But these others, I have no idea, are they the correct colors in the logo? Secondly, of course, if I need to make more functions, as I probably do in a real life project, I need to again hard code these values in there and there and there and other places. And of course, this will make errors. This is just bugs waiting to happen. So we need to do this better. We need to make these here more robust. So let's think about how you could have done this. And the first way to do this is to try to just abstract them as constants. And this is the third iteration. This is better. So here we have extracted red, gray, and brown as constants in a sense, or at least we're indicating that they're constants by using capital letters. Python doesn't really have real constants, so they can be changed. And the only thing that's changed is that we're asking now if color is in red, gray, and brown. This is the most simple fix you can do. Let's run both of these. That works perfectly. And again, the validation works fine. So this is a step better. Have we done this part great now? Well, I would say it's better, but you still have problems. So take a few seconds, pause the video maybe, and just think about, is this the best way you can do this? Maybe what are some problems with doing it in this way? Okay, so I hope you've thought about this for a slight bit. I'll give you some hints. So the thing is now that here are the three colors for say the company logo. Maybe the company adds another color, say that they also want blue. So that's zero to 55, zero. I mean, if it's like completely blue, but let's just say this for simplicity. What happens now? Now this is not so good because I've added another color here, but I haven't modified it here. So I've essentially made a scenario where if I want to extend the code, say by adding another color to the logo, then I need to add it multiple places. To make this code viable, I need to also do this. This is two places, right? But of course, in a real life code base, you need to go through all of your code, maybe in the same Python module and see, okay, where am I using these red, gray, and brown? I need to also add blue. So the code is really horrible to extend. Extending it is a pain that will probably leave you with plenty of errors. So let's just remove this for now and notice that extending this is tricky. The second thing that is not so good is a bit less crucial, but still a bit annoying, is that now we have three distinct global variables here that seemingly are not connected. We understand as humans, that they're clearly connected. These are three colors, but from a Python point of view, these are just three separate things that have nothing to do with each other. They're not grouped in any good way. So let's just again, run the code just to see that everything works, good. And let's go on to a fourth iteration, trying to do this slightly better. 
Here we've taken the dictionary approach. We've made a dictionary called valid colors mm -hmm, and made red, gray, and brown into keys and the actual RGB values into values. Good, right? Now, first of all, the minor problem, we've grouped them. The red, the gray, and the brown are all grouped now into a single global variable, the valid colors. So the minor problem is kind of fixed, but also the major problem is fixed because now what we're checking here is just if the color is in the valid color dot values, namely here, the tuples. And why is this kind of fixed the big problem? This has fixed the big problem because if I now go here and add some new color, let's do the blue one again. And now this is all that needs to be changed. I don't need to go inside this individual function, also add blue here somewhere. This is just picking the color from the valid colors. So I only need to change it at one place. So this is again, a lot better. I think I'll remove this blue one, but I hope you can see that it can more easily be extended now. And again, we have the same functionality. So it works for 30, doesn't work for 31. So I would say that this code, at least with regard to checking if the color is correct, is pretty good, but it can be done of course, slightly better. And this is where enums come in. And what is really missing? It seems now that it's like perfect, right? There are two minor problems left. One, I have to do valid colors dot values here. And this is understandable when the dictionary is right above and I can see, oh, we're clearly accessing a dictionary. So it, I need to write dot values. But imagine that this is like 200 lines above. And when you read this code for the first time, it's like if the color is in valid colors dot dot values? What is, what is dot values? And then you need to go up and like, oh, this is a dictionary and come down. So here we're essentially accessing into this structure here. And it's unclear from this point of view, what you're really doing. So this is the first minor problem. And I emphasize minor. This is not a horrible solution, but it has some minor problems. This is one of them. And the second minor problem is that in this example, it's quite understandable what valid colors mean, right? But say I wanted to add some string here or some metadata stating what this really means. Maybe these are valid colors for a company logo. This is a bit annoying to do in a dictionary. I can of course make a new entry and write it manually, but oh no, this is awful. I can make a separate variable, but no, this is not good. So I can't add meta information to this. This accessing is a bit cumbersome and strange, and I can't add meta information here. So of course, the point of this whole video, introducing enums. This is the enums way of doing it. This is from my point of view, the best way of doing it. Here, first of all, from the enum, we import the enum class. We saw this in the example in the documentation. We make a class called valid colors. Important to make a good variable name, should inherit from enums. Here I can add meta information. So say for example, this holds the valid colors as determined by the customer. This is super generic, but here you can add whatever you want. In terms of meta information, here you have the three variables, very easily to read. In my point of view, I think this is easier also to read than this. This is maybe just a preference, but here everything looks very clean. And now in the reduce RGB in color function, I can just ask if my color that I pass in is an instance of valid colors class. And just notice before we try to call it here, how easy this is to read. So this I read as if the color is an instance of valid colors, then we do this, else we do this. There is no dot values or something scary. This is just super easy to read. I mean, this is the type of code that make people go, oh, Python is just like pseudocode. This is so easy to read. So we fix the meta information here. We fix that this looks nicer and more understandable. We don't have this dot values. And a third amazing thing now is that when we call the function, we can just call it with, for instance, valid colors dot brown. And then I get the output here. So let's just run both of these. And as you can see, you get the same thing. Here I can do valid colors dot red, something like this. If I need to add more colors, I just add more colors here. Everything is fixed. Everything is easy to read. Everything is perfect. And this is the strength of enums. This is kind of the final iteration of this awful problem that you have where you hard code in the values. This will create bugs, it will create reducibility, and it will not scale well at all, all the way through making constants, through making dictionaries, and then finally to using enums that hold meta information can easily be extendable, have easily readable code, and so on. So when I look into other people's code and I see proper use of enums, I'm always like, oh, great. This person knows what they're doing. Some examples of when you can use it are colors, of course, but also weekdays, seasons, HTTP codes, maybe roles in an organization. Every time you have a fixed set of 
essentially members or roles that can be assigned. I hope this was useful to you and that you understand enums a little bit better now. So if you like the content we're providing here, then like and subscribe and I'll see you of course for the next video.